good evening. Um, I'm Dr. Charlotte Horn, and I am Paul Ice Jr. Partner. So you can imagine, um, if you are the partner of somebody that has a peristomal hernia repair named after them, you get to fix a lot of peristomal hernias too. Um, these are my disclosures. They're not relevant to this talk. So I think, you know what, a little bit about me. When I was training as a fellow at the Cleveland Clinic, we were doing multiple trials, and one of the randomized control trials that we were doing was a keyhole versus sugar baker repair for um, peristomal hernias. And we had to unroll 220 patients to complete this. So I got to fix a lot of peristomal hernias as a fellow. And it was pretty much normal after every case of the peristomal hernia that I took a picture of the ostomy in the OR so I could prove that it was alive then. Um, sometimes it didn't stay alive. Sometimes it wasn't so bad. And sometimes it was great. Rosen was never happy when I told him that the stoma was dead the next day. <laughs> So, why are peristomal hernias to fix? And I think when we think about patients that come to us with peristomal hernias, a lot of times people aren't like, oh my gosh, please give me a stoma, unless their quality of life is so terrible that they need this to improve their quality of life, whether it's cancer surgery or in fact, you know, incontinence, all of those things. Um, and so, like a hernia surgery where we're trying to improve quality of life, ostomies also should improve quality of life. So that should be the goal with any operation. And when you think about things that make uh, making a stoma hard there, you know, colon versus uh, ileum, uh, how much bowel length do you have? How much mesentery length do you have? Do you have a really thick abdominal wall? Where do your pants sit? Where are the creases in your abdomen? And then there are multiple patient factors, comorbidities that can make just making a stoma hard. And now your job is to make sure that they have a functional stoma, fix a big hernia that could be changing all of these, and put mesh next to bowel and hope that things go okay. So, in reality, peristomal hernias are a gift that keeps on giving. And 50% of stomas will go on to develop a peristomal hernia. With, you know, rates significantly higher if you have a colostomy. Um, ileostomies do a little bit better, but that's maybe because we reverse a lot more and ileoconduits technically are the best. And even in the best hands, the complication profile of a peristomal hernia repair is way, way worse than any ventral hernia repair. And so why is this problem so hard? First off, you have to make a hole. The defect size must be perfect. You have to play smash in a contaminated field, very, very close to bowel, and you want all those holes to be just perfectly tight. Oftentimes, you have other hernias to address. And heaven forbid that mesh and bowel interact in a negative way, it can be catastrophic. If things are too loose, it's a recurrence. And so this becomes a very, very thin margin of error in order to get a good outcome. And when we look at our operative approaches for primary or peristomal hernia repairs, we do not have any good answers. So a primary, I quote my patients, 100% recurrence. If we're fixing this with sutures, it will be back. Um, if you put intraperitoneal mesh, whether that's robot, lap, in a keyhole or sugar baker configuration, the recurrence rate is 10%. And a lot of times when we think of open ventral hernia repairs, we don't quote people a 10% recurrence rate, nor would we do an operation for a primary ventral hernia repair that has that amount of recurrence. Onlay meshes also do worse. And the retromuscular mesh used to be the kind of the gold standard or, or the go-to or the most definitive. And I will say that the 7.9% recurrence is way underestimating what the actual recurrence is. And so in reality, these are so hard to fix because we just don't have any good options. I think the other thing is, is when you do a sugar baker or a keyhole pair or any sort of retromuscular repair, you have multiple locations for problems. You can kill the stoma at the posterior sheath layer. You can kill the stoma where the mesh is. You can kill the stoma at the anterior sheath layer. And you can kill the stoma through the subcutaneous tissue. So there are so many problems. And certainly when Dr. Paul I first described it and the surgeons at the Cleveland Clinic put this into practice, things did not go as well as they had planned. <laughs> they were th in th 38 patients with some of the most aggressive um, hernia surgeons. Um, they had three mesh erosions uh, and had to explant mesh and recite stoma. So, you know, even though we try to do things that are more definitive, they get more mesh overlap, we're really just adding more places where things can go wrong. And we used to think, you know, Sugar Baker, the PPHR used to be the gold standard, and I think it probably still is. But we have to understand that maybe it's not as good as we thought it once was. And so this was a study that looked at biologic versus synthetic mesh, really in clean and clean contaminated cases. And when they evaluated their recurrences um, in these groups that had peristomal hernias, they found that 
the recurrence rates were almost 30% in both groups. We're talking retromuscular, either keyhole or sugar baker mesh configuration. Um, when they broke this down, they did find that a peristomal hernia recurrence was significantly higher in the keyhole repair versus a sugar baker. But what they just actually are about to publish is that the early complications are much higher in the sugar baker. So you kind of trade off that S being at a high risk for causing a acute stoma problem for a better long-term recurrence. So even in the best of hands, these outcomes are significantly worse than those if it was just a regular um, ventral hernia repair. And so I think the other thing that makes these hernias very challenging is there's multiple mechanisms of recurrence. So all of these slides are my recurrences. <laughs> so the first patient, she had a loop ileostomy. I did a what I thought was a nice, you know, lap uh, sugar baker repair, and this is, you can see those tacks there, she has recurred. <laughs> then what we did is we went back and we did a beautiful PPHR, and you can see that bow looks like it's lateralized nice and well. This is her scan one year after the operation. I just saw her back um, about a month ago, and now there's a little bit of bowel that's sneaking into the defect. And so even when you think, I've, at one year, I've, I've done it, things are going to be okay, oh, it's not over. <laughs> Um, and so I think when you think about why these are hard to fix, you are working in a 3D environment that you cannot predict when the patient's asleep in the OR table. You have to constantly deal with this interaction between the stoma and the mesh and how the abdominal wall functions. And it's a very dynamic situation. And you want things to be perfectly tight at that moment of, in the OR, but you have to understand that things are going to loosen over time. And so what you think is perfect now may be perfect at one year, but it might not be perfect at two years. And so in reality, the recurrences are happening you know, over time and sometimes longer than a lot of people think. And when you go back to why these people had stomas in the first place is obviously if they were reversible, you would just reverse them. But they're there to stay. And so we need to make sure that these outcomes are durable over time. And so I think when you think about this, there's still no good options. Even the best operation with the best hands has a recurrence rate of 10%. And no matter how much optimization you get for these patients, it's always a suboptimal situation. If you said to me, hey, you get to do a big open ventral hernia repair, there's an abscess there, they're a little bit overweight, and by the way, you're gonna, you're, you're gonna bridge. I'm gonna be like, I'm not gonna do that operation, that sounds terrible. But in reality, a peristomal hernia, there's always gonna be a hole in the rectus that you sort of have to bridge. You are always gonna need mesh, and it's always gonna be a contaminated. And there's a lot of things that you can do to kind of minimize that stuff, but it's never gonna be as good as you want it to be. And so the question is, I told you that fixing peristomal hernias is terrible, nobody should ever do it. How do you be successful? And I think the first thing is, is find a mentor. This is Dr. Paula and I in a bike, bike race, and I just rode behind him the whole time, so I could draft, it was fantastic. The other thing is, is evaluate and I think operate on your own recurrences. Because in reality, there are a lot of recurrences that will change your practice. And when you fix things, you can figure out why you weren't so good in the first place. And I think the most important thing is you need to be honest with patients about the outcomes. My conversation with a young patient that has a permanent stoma is significantly different than if you have a ventral hernia. Because I know that at the best situation, I can give you a 10% recurrence. And I'm not sure how durable that is over time. Thank you very much. This is Hershey. Okay, uh, so my name is Richard Liu. I'm from the University of Texas uh, Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas. And today I have the pleasure of talking about uh, minimally invasive sugar baker. Thank you for the organizing committee for inviting me to speak today. So here are my disclosures, but I've got one more, is that I am not a fan of peristomal hernias. I think that they're extraordinarily challenging. And uh, when, you, when you fix them, it leaves you a little bit less than satisfied. You know, it's not like your, you know, 30 minute uh, tap ventral hernia or, or glory, uh, you know, glory, glorious uh, ETEP. So um, what I want to do is discuss the state of MIS sugar baker repair, uh, patient selection uh, for uh, these cases and operative technique, uh, just a few pearls. And so um, peristomal hernias occur in almost half of the ostomies created. I would argue that you give an ostomy enough time and there's going to be some degree of, uh, of herniation. They cause significant morbidity, uh, you know, uh, ostomy site uh, um, issues, uh, 
ill-fitting ostomy appliances that uh, end up uh, getting the skin all uh, macerated. Um, it's just a bad problem. Risk factors for it, obesity, steroid use, increased age, increased intra-abdominal pressure, uh, just like most other hernias. Um, back in 2016, the HSQC uh, had a study and showed that 80%, nearly 80% of peristomal hernias were still repaired open. We do know that minimally invasive techniques offer lower morbidity, pain, recurrence, and recovery time. And in addition to this, I think the mesh placement can be a little bit more precise too. You're working intraperitoneal and uh, you can make sure that uh, you've got really nice overlap of mesh. Main laparoscopic repair types um, are the keyhole and sugar baker. And now, uh, you know, intro, uh, introduced recently was the uh, polymodified uh, sugar baker technique. So you can see here the keyhole does uh, have a higher recurrence than sugar baker. So. I think peristomal hernias is a Goldilocks scenario. You make it too tight, you have conduit issues. You make it too loose, you got hernia issues. It's a bad problem. So with a sugar baker technique, um, it's all about lateralizing the conduit. And uh, this helps offset the site of where the conduit is coming through the abdominal wall and then ultimately through the skin. And again, uh, you know, this is different from the classically described sugar baker for sugar baker himself. Uh, this, uh, the ones that we do these days are, are modified. Um, we've already kind of discussed this in the last talk, so I'm not going to go through that. Um, so patient selection and optimization. The best solution to peristomal hernia, reverse the ostomy. So do everything possible to work up the patient. You know, if there's any way possible the patient can be ostomy free, that's going to be the best solution. Convert loop to end ostomies. Uh, optimize controllable corporate morbidities, smoking, weight, diabetes, et cetera, just like any other hernia you would be doing. Uh, imaging and opera reports are uh, critical. So were there prior uh, repairs in the past with mesh, not with mesh, other defects and abdominal wall measurements, right? Um, because if you have a, uh, just a discrete peristomal hernia, it's challenging enough already. But now if you have that coupled with uh, you know, something on the contralateral side or a bunch of midline defects, then you might need to do something a little bit more significant, such as a retromuscular repair. Positioning and prep, control the ostomy, all right? Uh, and then for most of these uh, minimally invasive ventral hernia repairs, uh, we tend to flex at the hips to expand the space between the costal margin and the hips uh, to give you more working room. Uh, it is key that, uh, you know, when you get in, after you lice adhesions, you understand the patient's anatomy, where things are going, that you really do lateralize the, uh, the conduit. So here I'm taking uh, bites of the mesenteric fat here to kind of push it uh, um, laterally on the abdominal wall. All right. Um, it's also very important. Uh, you see some fat on the right of the conduit. If you're going to do any intra-abdominal repair for any type of IPOM, you really need to make sure that you clear all that fat away so there's good apposition of mesh to the abdominal wall. Okay. After that, uh, uh, we close the defect. Again, uh, you know, you got to be really careful when you do this. Uh, you got to make sure that there's still enough space for your grasper to go in um, so that the conduit is not uh, uh, kinked off. Once this is uh, closed up, you're going to measure your space for uh, the mesh. And um, here I'm using a parietine DS. It's uh, um, a coated mesh. And the next part is to make a nice tunnel for the conduit. So I uh, wish I had a loop. Oh, here we go. So over here, I'm going to run uh, two sets of barb sutures on either side of the conduit. Um, to really create a nice tunnel for this. If you make it too loose, what can happen with increased abdominal pressure and this uh, conduit moving around is that it can herniate even further under the mesh and voila, you'll get a recurrence. So at the end, uh, this is what uh, it looks like. Uh, it's gotta be snug, uh, but not too tight. So again, uh, Goldilocks type scenario, um, but you can see I've really made a tunnel for that, uh, that um, uh, conduit and then you secure the rest of the mesh circumferentially. Uh, this came from the same study that uh, Dr. Pauli uh, uh, quoted, uh, you know, um, uh, or this picture was uh, um, uh, taken from that study. So potential complications. Uh, so besides your postoperative uh, surgical site occurrences, uh, wound complications, fluid collections, the one that you really, really need to be careful on and uh, be very vigilant for is conduit obstruction necrosis. You know, if the ostomy was working fine before you took the patient back to surgery and all of a sudden it's not or it's looking bad, 
then well, your your surgery is probably the culprit here. So uh, most of the time, if uh, you've, you have a persistent ischemic uh, ostomy, you're going to need to uh, uh, operate on it and revise the repair. Um, this is usually caused because the mesh is too tight or somehow the conduit has kinked. And again, there's multiple layers that this uh, loop of bowel needs to go through. And so if you have any, um, you know, transverse oriented shifting of those components, you can potentially kink this off. So in conclusion, peristomal hernias are challenging and they're absolutely not my favorite. Surgeons should understand the unique nuances to peristomal hernia pair, um, such as the direction that the conduit is coming out. Uh, not to kink it, right? A conduit patency is critical and mesh overlap as well. And honestly, uh, whatever you do decide to do, just make sure that you're comfortable with it. Um, sometimes the best solution may not be the, the ones that we see in all these, uh, uh, you know, uh, social forms or whatnot, but a good operation is a good operation. So um, at that, uh, with that, I'll, I'll conclude. Thank you so much. So I'm going to spend a few minutes and talk about um, some of the technical considerations for doing a retromuscular uh, sugar baker repair. Um, a lot of the considerations are different than when we do intraperitoneal sugar bakers, which uh, Dr. Liu is going to talk about. And so really few of the points I'm going to make I think are, uh, are relevant to, to his talk, so hopefully there won't be uh, much overlap. All right, so these are my disclosures. They haven't uh, changed since uh, my last uh, presentation. So if you're interested, the very first colostomy was made in 1793 um, on an infant who had uh, imperforate anus. Uh, we've had 230 years to fix that uh, since that time, and we have not figured out the right way to fix hernias that occur around ostomy sites. And so I'm going to talk with you a bit about some technical parts of polyperistomal hernia repair. Most of what I'm going to tell you is kind of how the technique evolved over the course of time. And, and to do that, we have to think a little bit about the, the operations that it's based off of, all right? So Sugar Baker described his first surgery in 1980. This is uh, in um, basically the Journal of American College of Surgeons' original name. Um, he described it, you know, making a midline laparotomy, uh, taking down adhesions, uh, leaving the hernia sac, and he basically cut the mesh so it filled the fascial defect. He, he essentially did an inlay repair. Okay, but what he did was he left a space in the lateral aspect and let the colon sneak up. There's no mesh overlap here, none. So the thing that we think of as a sugar baker repair is not even remotely close to a sugar baker repair. People modified the technique and did something slightly different. He then closed the primary fascia at the end. Now, if you want to look for the first retromuscular peristomal repairs, this is a paper from uh, Alexander and Bill Yeo in 1983. They would do an open takedown of the stoma and make a pocket that was retrorectus, and then they would continue the pocket between the transversus and the internal oblique, right? So they made an, they did an intramuscular component separation. They obviously took down the neurovascular bundles, but look, look where their mesh is, right? They've got a big retromuscular mesh. They moved the stoma. They're showing you they moved it from a bad lateral location and put it back through the rectus. And they've reinforced the ostomy with mesh from the very beginning, you know, sort of primary mesh reinforcement, okay? And this looks very similar to how I learned how to do retromuscular repairs. And, and notably, they also said, hey, if you've got a, a hernia in the midline or you want to move it to the contralateral side, you can just do a contralateral retrorectus dissection. So this is kind of the infancy of retromuscular hernia repairs. The way that I learned to do retromuscular peristomals was to take down the stoma 100% of the time and then do a posterior rectus sheath release, do your tar around that, close the old ostomy site, move the stoma to the contralateral side, make a hole in the posterior sheath, put in some mesh, make a hole in the mesh, deliver it through, and what you have is an ostomy that's reinforced at the new site on the contralateral side. You've got a midline that's widely covered with mesh, and you have an old stoma site that has mesh covering the entire thing, okay? This is a pretty good operation. Um, but the downside is two things. Number one, if you think about how that ostomy comes through the abdominal wall, it comes through the posterior layer, the mesh, the muscle, the fascia, and the skin as three independent layers, and it's very easy to do it wrong or to have scissoring in the retromuscular plane that causes ischemia or kinks. The second issue is that obviously the mesh, uh, the mesh has been cut around the ostomy site, and it's also been cut um, near the midline. And so as a consequence of that, when people get hernias back, 
they get them right here. And because you've so widely reinforced the rest of the abdominal cavity, that defect in the mesh becomes an extraordinary defect in terms of the overall pressure of the abdominal wall. It is the only weak spot that is not reinforced with mesh. And so um, while the initial papers on this from Mike Rosen and Yuri Davitsky at Cleveland showed an acceptable risk at 13 months, uh, there are some problems with it. Bowel needs to be moved. You've got multiple wound sites. You've got a lot of bowel mobilization. The mesh is cut. And as I mentioned, there are some problems with the stomas that happen when you take them down and move them to a new location. So the modification that, that we came up with uh, was really a complete accident. I was doing a course um, at the University of uh, Pennsylvania, and it, we were doing a cadaver course with ostomies that we had just created, and somebody wanted to learn how to do a tar, and I said, can we please just leave the stoma up? I don't want to have to deal with cadaver stool. And I was just being lazy, and sure enough, this idea kind of popped into my head. And so we went home and did some additional cadaver work. And so these are our initial cadaver dissections. Um, we gave the cadavers stomas, and then we basically did a retrorectus dissection and did a tar around the ostomy in situ. And here's a wide tar plane. And then we did the thing that we tell you not to do, which is to make a hole in the posterior layer and intentionally then lateralize the bowel, closing lateral to medial, so that all of that bowel is now in the retromuscular space. Um, on the contralateral side, you can do a retrorectus, you can do a tar, whatever you need to do to have a landing zone. And then you put some mesh in, and you can put any kind of mesh that you want in the plane. We initially envisioned it with transfascial sutures. Um, this is what it looks like, and the nice part is that area where the mesh is cut, the mesh is now no longer cut, and you also have not had to take down and move the stoma and redo the mucocutaneous junction. Mike Rosen and his group at the Cleveland Clinic did the initial study on this, and they did 38 patients. And again, they had an 11% recurrence rate. The biggest issues that they saw were in the early phases, uh, some erosions. They had two patients with perforations on day 8 and day 12. This is a learning curve of this operation. These are configured too tightly, okay? If you have a perforation on day 8 at your new stoma site, it's just too tight. They had one patient who came back at four months with an ischemic stoma, that patient had fistulizing Crohn's and an endiliostomy on the left-hand side and also had an early obstruction that eventually resolved. So probably was also pretty tight at the same time. Um, we ultimately eliminated transfascial sutures, and we realized a couple things. We'd eliminated them from our other repairs, and we realized you also don't need those sutures to keep bowel from getting up. Um, so if you eliminate transfascial sutures, then one of the things you can do is lateralize the bowel any way you want. So if you have an ileostomy, the mesentery doesn't go lateral, it goes inferior. If you've got a urostomy, it goes straight down toward the myopectineal orifice. That's where the ureters are located. If you've got an encolostomy, it goes towards the upper quadrant. And so the word lateral, when we think about lateralizing a stoma, to me, no longer means going lateral to allow sutures to go through the muscular abdominal wall. You can lateralize inferior. You can lateralize superior. The only thing you can't do is really lateralize across the midline because if you do that, you have an area where there's fascia closed with bowel underneath but no mesh reinforcement, okay? So you really can't cross the midline with it. So getting rid of those transfascial sutures also did the following thing. You know, I worried that when we put the mesh right to the edge of the bowel, we weren't covering additional areas. And so we changed our mesh configuration as well. And this is sort of what I do now. Um, here, this is us putting the mesh in. We've already tucked it on the near side of the dissection. And I'm going to push that out to the edge where it sits very loosely against the, the bowel entering the retromuscular plane. And then all we're going to do is take some scissors. And rather than cutting off that mesh and throwing it out, I'm simply going to make a slit in the mesh. And then we're going to wrap the tails of the mesh around the bowel where it enters the retromuscular plane. So this is keyholed in the area where the bowel enters the retromuscular plane. And it's then essentially sugar bakered for the remainder of the repair. I don't suture those keyholes together. I just wrap it around there. Again, this is a little bit of laziness, but it turns out it actually makes the mesh sit very nicely. And you can see both the sugar baker and the keyhole configurations there. Um, if you want to think about mesh choice, uh, this study uh, just came out uh, looking at contaminated fields, about 50-50 biologic mesh and synthetic. Um, but interestingly enough, they looked at the mesh configuration and all of the erosions in the series from, from bowel were in the cruciate configurations, none with a retromuscular sugar baker. And if you compare the, the re reoccurrence rates there, uh, 30 versus 10 was not statistically significant, but I'll take a clinically relevant but not statistically significant difference any day of the week. So I'll conclude the repair has evolved over the course of time based off of those anatomic configurations. The key concept of retromuscularization of the bowel remains. 
Um, but there are some complications that you need to learn how to do. I showed earlier in the day today a, a, a mesh fracture after this operation. I will say all of the versions of the surgery are quite challenging, and you should really have a good grasp of a lot of different types of repairs, I think, before you take this on. Uh, with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much. here uh, to uh, discuss uh, maybe the next level. Um, so this is uh, about um, recurrent peristoma hernia uh, after previous mesh repair. Um, and it's uh, mainly about the technical uh, considerations. Um, these are my disclosures. Some of them are relevant. And one more disclosure is that I do like treating peristoma hernias. I'm probably the crazy guy. Um, Main questions when you have a recurrent parastomal hernia is, of course, is robotic surgery an option? Because I do the mainly robotically, uh, the type of the stoma. So we've discussed these things uh, previously. And of course, the previous operations. And the main thing you really want to know is what has been done to the stoma previously. What kind of repairs have been done and what mesh has been used and in what layer is that mesh? Because that's going to be important for your reconstruction. So the robotic setup is actually quite simple, uh, contralateral port placement, um, and you will need a, a, an, an, uh, an added extra port for, uh, for sutures and for mesh. And I used to keep the, uh, the stoma in sight, uh, but nowadays I, I don't use transvascular sutures anymore. So I try to cover as much of the skin as possible because I believe that skin is our enemy as surgeons. So the operative steps. Um, I want to do a full abdominal adhesiolysis. I want everything completely freed up. And the main thing that I want full adhesiolysis of is of the um, stoma conduit itself. And that's where the robot kicks in, where you can really, really get the stoma conduit to be completely freed up uh, so that you can prevent that there's, there's still bowel in that cavity after you've placed your mesh and patients are gonna say, well, there's still a bulge there. And it's not a hernia, it's just uh, uh, added uh, extra bowel that's still in there. Uh, then I'm going to do a retromuscular dissection. Of course, you have to think about concomitant midline uh, repair that you're going to do in the same time. So depending on that, you're going to start either contralaterally from the stoma or ipsilaterally to the stoma. And of course, we're going to do the unilateral tar, as was discussed before. So the first case is after a sugar baker. These are the most of the cases because a sugar baker, everyone these days just whacks in a, a, a mesh onto a stoma and because it's easy and it's quick and it's good. It's the best we have so far, uh, according to evidence. So you'll see here, actually, that when you start loosening up, this is the CT scan of this patient. Um, when you start opening up the retromuscular space, I start here in the midline. I take a bit of the uh, peritoneal uh, in the midline to get uh, to increase my, uh, my mesh size. Um, once you go into the retromuscular space here, it's actually surprising. The retromuscular space is absolutely untouched. Those tackers, the mesh, they don't go into the fascia. They go into the peritoneum at best, and it'll sort of stick there. But I think that's one of the reasons why a why sugar baker is probably uh, aren't that strong. Of course, below the arcuate line, you're going to have a little more trouble because the uh, the mesh is going to be uh, sort of the peritoneum there. One thing that I always have started doing is I cut the posterior layer towards the stoma conduit, and I do that because then I can properly have tension on that layer when I'm cutting around the stoma because the mesh and the peritoneum, so the posterior layer there, is going to be really stuck to that bowel. So, and that's the most dangerous part of the operation in my, in my opinion. So here you see fully freely dissected uh, uh, stoma conduit. It looks like crap because there's bowel on there and there's omentum on there. It's just accept it and leave it. The next steps of the operation I'm going to get to in the next video. So the technical considerations after a lab sugar baker, do I take out the old mesh? Only if it's necessary for some reason, but otherwise I just leave it. What do you do with the mesh on the bowel? It's there, it's there forever, unless you take out the bowel. So just leave it. The next step is after there's been a previous retromuscular repair, which makes it a bit more difficult to do a retromuscular repair. This case had two previous retromuscular repairs. And one of the f uh, uh, things you straight away see is how the, the loop, the, the, the conduit, is stuck in that retromuscular area. So you're not going to be able to pull it out. You're not be able to reposition the bowel downwards into the abdomen. It's just stuck there because it's, a, it's stuck to the old meshes. 
So don't start with this. Don't start with mobilizing the bowel. Start with your retromuscular dissection. Start in an area where there's no previous mesh. So either contralaterally or ipsilaterally. So in this case, the previous meshes were not that big, luckily. And you can see here, this layer is really thick and there's mesh in there and I'm struggling to get it. And again, I cut towards the stoma. I can repair that layer later on. It's been there, so it'll stay there. And in a safe distance from the bowel, I'm going to leave a bit of that posterior layer onto the, onto the stoma and just go around the stoma. Of course, we're going to have to do our tar. So uh, in this case, uh, uh, I'm, this is the caudal part of the, uh, uh, um, of the tar. You cannot do a bottom-up tar because you have to go around the stoma. So you're going to have to start your tar here again in the cranial part. Again, more difficult is if there's previous mesh there. In this case, actually, the mesh was placed uh, uh, quite medially, luckily for me, so it wasn't too difficult to perform the, uh, the tar there. So that went actually quite fluently. That wasn't a difficult part. So once this plane has been fully uh, developed, I want all of that bowel out of that hernia sac. That's for me, that's, I think that's a really important thing. And you can see here that actually here, this is an extra loop. Below is an extra loop of bowel. And you will see that the stoma conjoint is, ab is above in, in, in the screen. And this extra loop of bowel needs to come out completely because otherwise it's going to be a recurrence for the patient and it's going to get stuck and it's going to be in your way. So really, really work to free out, to free up this. One thing, uh, or caution there is if there has been a onlay mesh repair, that bowel is going to be stuck in the cavity to that onlay mesh. So beware of that before you start so <laughs> pulling at the, at the stoma conduit there, it's going to be stuck inside. So beware that you don't pull it. Um, another thing is, it's not a major issue, but remember that there's mesh there. So the, the, the hole is going to be rigid. The hernia hole, the, the, it's going to be rigid. So it's going to take you a bit more uh, uh, force to be able to close. Uh, then, of course, uh, we lateralize the, uh, the stoma conduit, which I think is a, is a, is a, a majorly important step in this uh, in this operation that we really get the uh, the stoma as far lateral or in the uh, range of the uh, of the mesentery and then we i measure and i place a mesh after this so the technical considerations after a uh, retromuscular repair are slightly different so i do a full analysis but i don't try to free up the loop itself the, the conduit itself so i start with my retromuscular dissection and i start to freeing up the the, the the conduit when i get there Mesh extraction, no. Uh, concurrent ventral hernia, do I use one mesh or do I use two meshes? I started out using one, but I found out that I actually preferred doing two. I, I treat them as separate <coughs> entities. So I do a peristomal hernia repair and I do a midline hernia repair. And if it's too big, you just do a bilateral tar all the way, like Eric was just explaining. Uh, you just do a really big mesh and then, uh, so that's, that's you know, the next step. Um, so two meshes usually for me. What kind of mesh do I use uh, in these cases? And actually, I'm uh, going towards uh, uh, more and more uh, using a biological mesh in these cases because of the uh, erosions. And I've had one erosion of a uh, polypropylene mesh into a uh, ileal conduite, uh, conduit, and uh, um, the patient is just messed up completely. So I'm not sure about it, but I do prefer to use a biological mesh. And the thing is, make sure that it's really really far to uh, lateral you have to have a big mesh and it has to run all the way down lateral fixation mesh method i don't use tackers i use sutures and i don't use transfascial sutures and these days as uh, uh, richard just said the bowel can actually slip as a as a sliding hernia behind the mesh upwards so using a biological mesh i now dare to fix the mesh to the to the to the conduit so at the, where the mesh will go behind the conduit, uh, the, the conduit will go behind the mesh. I actually suture the mesh. I fix it to the bowel itself. I've done that now five or six times, no problems at all so far. So that's just a couple of months, but I, I th I'm quite happy about that. Um, that's about this. That's it for me. Thanks. I think we'll have the questions together at the end. So would you like to introduce the next, invite the next speaker? Yeah, 
Hello. Uh, good evening. Uh, this is Praveen. Uh, apparently, I'm the uh, supposed to be the youngest speaker among the list today. So my talk is going to be towards the young Turks out there. So parastomal hernias are definitely uh, challenging uh, hernias to treat. Uh, this may disclosure. I'm I work for Curium Life Technologies as well as a medical A consultant. So yeah. Parastomal hernias is always a challenging hernia to treat irrespective of the experience of the surgeon, be it the higher recurrence rates, chances of surgical site occurrences, the concomitant presence of midline defects and the morbidity associated with the stoma itself before the procedure and after the procedure and the steep learning curve of both the open and minimally invasive techniques. Uh, just giving a brief introduction to the classification of uh, parastomal hernias. There are different classifications that are uh, available there, but the most uh, reproducible one, which we are use common, which we use commonly on a day-to-day -day basis in our setup, is the EHS classification. Uh, they depend on both the radiological uh, defect size and the clinical aspects as well. So you have uh, types one, two, three, and four based on the defect size, and they classify smaller and larger hernias based on five centimeters, which is being the cutoff for the defect size. So yeah, what are the, what are the various uh, repairs that can be done? So the simplest one would be the primary suture repair with or without relocating the stoma, but still it has a very high recurrence rates. Based on this paper, they have almost a 50% recurrence rate for a primary suture repair. It is not being advised for elective parastomal hernia repairs. Uh, if you are dealing with an older patient or a sicker patient, or you are dealing with a very complex concomitant procedure that is being performed, then this can be a possible option. And do we are we able to achieve a tension-free closure? That is a very uh, important question to think of. So it is better to avoid uh, primary suture repair in the elective setting. And if you're going to put in a mesh, what are the configurations that are available? These are very well known. You have the sugar baker type of configuration where you put it intraperitoneally or the polyase modification where you do it in the retromuscular plane or the keyhole configuration where you just slit the mesh and this can be done both in the onlay, sublay or the underlay planes or the cruciate, cons uh, cruciate type of mesh configuration where you do it onlay, sublay or even underlay. So what are the our choice of repairs in our center? So for EHS1 hernias, which are small parastomals without a midline defect, we go for lap sugar bakers. And for EHS2, 3, and 4 types of parastomal hernias, either they are a large pH with or without a midline defect or a small pH with a concomitant midline defect, we go for retromuscular repairs. We opt for either open, lap, or robotic, depending upon how the patient suits. So we do a PCS with a tar or the PPHR, polis modification. So this is how a uh, sugar baker uh, repair looks like. You have a uh, intraperitoneal uh, mesh that is placed after lateralizing the bubble with a minimal uh, tunnel length of about five centimeters. So we have a 60 years old lady who presented to us two years post a lap APR for a carcinoma rectum with a swelling near her stoma for six months. And this was a very small fat containing hernia uh, which fit into EHS type one. We went in for a sugar baker type of repair. And those were the port positions there. So looking at this, we start. We first start with the adhesiolysis. There was dense bowel additions to the previous sites. Uh, this is the content that is being reduced there. The omentum, and once we get the omentum back into the cavity, we still find that a loop of small bowel still other into the stomal loop there. So we carefully dissect that. And once the other cellulosis and the reduction of contents is done, this is the defect that is being described. And the defect is being closed with barb sutures. And once the defect is closed, we reinforce it by lateralizing the loop by placing on a composite mesh. And this is how the final appearance looks like. 
This is about a 57 years old male. Uh, he has underwent a radical cystectomy with an ileal conduit two years back. He had a small pH hernia, parastomal hernia with a concomitant midline defect. So this mounted us to EHS type 2. If you can look at the CT here, he has a 4, 42 millimeters, I mean some 4.2 centimeters defect with a small midline defect as well. So we went in for a E-tip repair on the retromuscular plane. So these were our port positions. Our initial access was through uh, optical entry, optical entry, and uh, finally we enter into the retrorectus plane. We dissect right up to the Coopers there, inferiorly. We then do the crossovers. This is our second working port. The supramedial crossover to the opposite retroactor space. The second port that is being done, the crossover to the opposite space. And we do the tar. So we carefully incise and cut off the transverse fibers of the transverse abdominis muscle. We start from the cranial end and go towards the caudal end. And <coughs> once that is done, we then close the posterior uh, defect in the posterior fascia with the stoma in situ. And we then close the defect, the actual parastomal defect. And we finally place the mesh. The mesh is slit and it is placed in a keyhole fashion. As it was a permanent stoma, permanent ileal conduit, we were not able to recite it as well. So uh, this technique no needs no introduction because we have the inventor right in front of us. A modified uh, sugar baker configuration of placing the stomal loop within the retromuscular space. So we had a 58 years old male with an encolostomy after an open APR. He had a six centimeter parastomal uh, defect with multiple midline defects as well. So as you could see, he has a midline scar with multiple defects and a parastomal hernia. So this got fit into EHS type four and he has been presenting to us with self-limiting episodes of obstruction. So looking at the CT, he has a huge uh, parastomal defect with multiple midline defects out there. So for this particular patient, we opted for the open repair. So this is how the uh, stomal loop looked like uh, and the defect. So we created the retromuscular space, the retroactor space dissection was done. And as usual, uh, we did a tar. And after uh, incising the PRS and closing it from the medial to the lateral aspect so that the bubble gets lateralized uh, in a sugar baker fashion in the retromuscular plane, we were able to place a medium weight polypropylene mesh over there. And this is how the post-operative outcome look like. So uh, this picture comes from courtesy Dr. Ahmarora. So this is a post-op follow-up CT after a, a PPHR repair. So that the, the line over there describes the mesh and the blue line over there describes how lateralized, how the bowel looks being lateralized there. So. So this is another technique which, uh, which has been described by the Cleveland Cleaning Group for uh, where we reinforce the ostomy site with the mesh. And uh, this is another the staple mesh reinforcement technique which is a procedure to prevent a parastomal herniation. So the take home message for the young Turks out there, for younger surgeons like me, the treatment of parastomal hernias can sometimes be even worse than the disease itself. So while you're creating a stoma, be it if it's an elective procedure for which the stoma is being created, plan it accordingly, involve the stoma therapist, involve the stoma nurse, plan it accordingly so that the patient doesn't develop a hernia. Okay. So as the ounce of prevention is worth than a pound in cure, prevention is always better in the case of parastomal hernias. And if you get a hernia, parastomal hernia, get it treated with the help of other seniors around. Yeah, thank you.
First of all, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to be here and to, to present as a part of this uh, enorm enormous uh, event. Okay, my name is Fahim Kanani and I'm a fifth year resident in Tel Aviv uh, Medical Center. Um, <clears throat> I feel to be a little bit repetitive because, because all my uh, previous colleagues talked a little bit about the same argument, but I'm gonna uh, try to be synthetic. Okay, so um, I'm gonna uh, talk to you uh, about, I'm, I'm gonna describe and make a proposal of, tec uh, of a new technique or novel technique for not so rare entity uh, using our uh, experience in, Medi in uh, Ichelov Medical Center. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna talk about midline POVH repair using open retromuscular technique in presence of ileal conduit with or with, without, with not uh, parastomal hernia concomitant. Okay, when we are talking about parastomal hernia, so we are, we are considering and dealing with incisional hernia related to an abdominal wall stoma. Um, at some degree, the literature uh, accepts and talks about inevitable uh, parastomal hernia uh, uh, development. Uh, some uh, series talks about 90% prevalence of uh, parastomal hernia, and it's well um, explained with the uh, law of Laplace and uh, Boisil, and we are not going into details, but this is uh, the rule that uh, uh, explains this phenomena. So when I uh, prepared my talk, I based my, uh, my, my talk about, um, on a uh, um, couple of articles. The most important that I um, find, for, for m in my opinion, it was the parastomal hernia repair, um, and actually, Despite the significant advances in uh, abdominal wall reconstruction, parastomal hernia is still a complex problem and uh, the risk of recurrence is very high. So until now, we don't have a real consensus about how, which is the optimal management of parastomal hernia, whether uh, to watchful, watchful wait, relocate the stoma, or to, uh, when it's possible, also to recannulate the bowel and take down the stoma. And uh, there are also some um, techniques in open repair and minimally invasive repair. So it's still very, uh, really challenging because of poor outcomes uh, after repairing, historical lack of standardization regarding hernia classification, and there are also differences in the duration of follow-up uh, in the various studies. Um, my colleague before me talked a little bit about the uh, classification. So the European Hernia Society in 2014 uh, made a classification considering the diameter of the hernia, the parastomal hernia, and taking into consideration also if there is a concomitant midline uh, uh, POVH or not. Uh, and uh, the scope was actually to describe the same parameters in the various studies to be able to, uh, to make the confrontation and comparison between them, and in the future to be able to make a guidelines uh, to, to use um, um, uh, the best way for uh, repairing these hernias. Uh, when we are talking about the risk factors of uh, uh, her parastomal hernia development, so we consider age above 60 years, female gender obesity, smoking, COPD, and malignancies. Those uh, lines that I bolded, it's uh, our uh, pool of patients that have these um, morbidi comorbidities. So other things that is important in the development of hernia is also stoma formation. So if it's emergent, for example, or it's in a appropriate stoma location, extensive fascia uh, dissection, and so on. If we consider the stoma location, there is no uh, the, the the literature is controversial about the um, the place of the stoma, but actually some uh, literature is uh, saying that uh, going through the rectus have less possibility to develop uh, a parastomal hernia. Uh, also, uh, we should also consider extraperitoneal tunneling versus a single focal defect through the layers. And some, something which is very important, and uh, the literature is uh, um, talking about it um, uh, more frequently, uh, prevention with mesh, which makes, um, which reduces the um, risk of developing of uh, hernia 
four folds less than uh, the normal the normal and it's actually uh, accepted in uh, in uh, in literature okay some uh, a couple of words about recurrence rates I, I would do to uh, to look at the suture uh, primary suture repair which has in some series arrives to 70 percent recurrences uh, in front of uh, sublay mesh which goes uh, in, uh, which is uh, uh, around seven percent when we talk about diagnosis, it's still also challenging. Once it was considered, uh, um, the clinical examination was the best thing to do. But now, uh, in, uh, recently, we had a study that shows that CT and ultrasound is good enough for uh, the diagnosis and the follow-up uh, of hernias. I brought here um, a table in which the first four um, techniques that you see here Sugar, bacon, and keyhole, every one of us knows uh, what we are talking about, and they are historically. And we have other two uh, techniques that are uh, described in literature. Uh, one, um, uh, which used by uh, Riagini, um, and, uh, which was um, described in 2014, he used a modified keyhole technique. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Pauli, um, actually, he uh, also described a combined uh, tar with modified sugar baker. We, in our uh, clinic, uh, in uh, Echelov Medical Center, we just uh, tried to make an open uh, retromuscular repair. We called it also modified ribs stopa repair because we, um, we correct also the midline defect and we try also to reinforce the parastomal sp uh, space even if there is no uh, parastomal hernia. So what we do actually is to, um, we make the ribs and uh, we uh, try to suture the posterior layer to uh, recreate the envelope of the abdomen. We, uh, we um, make a release of all the parastomal hernia continent and to, to put it down into the abdomen. Uh, after that, we make a slit in the, um, in the mesh uh, and we, um, we secure it with sutures uh, in all the uh, parts of the, uh, in, around the stoma. So our results of an, uh, our unpublished data, we had uh, until now six patients with a median age of 70 years. Uh, all of them were, uh, most of them were males, heavy smokers. All of them had a midline POVH. Four uh, of them with concomitant parastomal hernia type four. Uh, all had an open uh, retromuscular repair with parastromal reinforcement. Um, a mean follow-up uh, time was the 24 months. Uh, one of them had a bulging in the midline, but in CT there's no recurrence of CT uh, on CT of, of the hernia. No surgical site occurrences, but one patient had a steroid seroma. And actually, we didn't have uh, we we didn't have to remove a mesh for no one of these patients. And there was no problems with, uh, due to the stoma, the mesh, um, uh, such as, uh, uh, for example, infection or uh, erosion to the stoma itself. Um, and here I, I put a, um, a, a video that uh, reassumes one of our operation. So we have a large defect here in the midline. We introduce a Foley catheter in, into the ileal conduit to uh, be able to uh, to protect it. Um, after that, we mix, we we, we proceed with the ribs and uh, uh, reconstruct the the posterior layer. Um, and we take the uh, proline mesh, uh, ultra pro uh, mesh, and we make a slit and put it uh, around the 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 ileal conduit and secure it with with uh, with sutures. Um, so th this is the operation. And this is the patient afterwards. Um, and now, actually, my, my uh, take home message. So parastomal hernias is really um, a complex condition, as we uh, already know, uh, with all the talks of my colleagues. Uh, there is a lack of available uh, uh, data, which is the best way uh, that we have to use when operating parastomal hernias, we, uh, surgeons uh, should 
know the risk and the benefits of the available techniques to be able to maximize the safety when dealing with, her with these hernias and to, uh, to arrive to a long-term reconstructive success. Actually, in this field, uh, we need further research to, to be able to, um, to know or to reform the guidelines for what method is going to be uh, the best one for dealing with, with these hernias. And thank you.